This is the second of the terms lectures, and just a puff for next week, where we have Lise Grande and David Keane on peace building in today's world. So we've got a yeah, the lineup is fantastic. You can see the whole lineup on the ID website. Um, so do please come. So once again, all mics off, please. Uh, especially if, if you have people rattling knives and forks, as seem to be happening with some. All right, let's uh, let's get on with the show. I've had the thumbs up that we are live. So. Welcome everybody, my name is Duncan Green. I'm professor in practice in the Department of International Development and I'm chairing tonight. Um, this session has been recorded, including the Q&A. You'll be able to ask questions in chat in Zoom. Um, oh, the cutlery is still there. Um, you'll be able to ask questions in chat in Zoom or on YouTube. But if you wish to ask anonymous questions, uh, please private message James Putzel. If you are a tweeter, please use the hashtag, hashtag cutting edge issues. And that's all the digital housekeeping that I can think of. So let's get on with the actual show. So tonight's topic is human rights organizing in Africa during a global pandemic, trends and insights. And I can think of nobody better to talk to us about this than Irungu Houghton. So I first met Irungu uh, in 2003 at the WTO summit. Uh, uh, and at that point, the world and their dog was, was, were campaigning on trade. And I was working for a small NGO in Britain. We went in to listen to the big developing countries, Brazil, China, India, talk about their positions. And at some point in the middle of their presentation, they said, and we're now gonna stop our presentation and invite Oxfam to come on stage. Every NGO in the audience was torn between admiration for Oxfam's advocacy and hatred of Oxfam for its success. And Irungu appeared in flowing robes, absolutely brilliant, gave a great speech and handed over a petition of, I think, 20 million signatures to the agriculture, to, to the trade ministers of the big G20 countries saying, we support you in your effort to stop the, principally the EU and the US rewriting trade rules to their own benefit and to your um, you know, disbenefit. And uh, I was very impressed. I've been just as impressed in every other contact I've had with Irungu since. He is currently executive director for Amnesty International Kenya, but he's worked and volunteered with some of the most influential organizations in the world, including ActionAid, Equality Now, Oxfam, as I said, and he's advised several African governments, the African Union and the G8, among others. Um, so he is a, a, a very interesting figure in terms of moving between spheres and understanding the language and what works to influence people at different levels. So he's a perfect person to come and talk to us about human rights organizing. Our discussant is equally distinguished, Chaloka Bayani. He's the Associate Professor of International Law at LSE Law School and a member of the Center for the Study of Human Rights and Chair of its Advisory Board. He's also a member of the Center for Climate Change at the LSE, and he is the UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of internal, Internally Displaced Persons. So, uh, Irungu, I gather to our delight that you're not going to use slides. So this is great. We get to hear from you. So you've got 30 to 45 minutes. We'll then go to Chaloka, and then we'll go into Q&A. So take it away, please, Irungu. Thank you very much, Duncan. And let me just start by saying you have the uh, memory of an elephant and the uh, grace of a gazelle in terms of how you introduced me, um, which probably covers two out of the big five. Um, the second thing I wanted to just say was that really I'm fulfilling a lifetime uh, dream of my family, which is to speak on Houghton Street, uh, albeit virtually, uh, given that my surname is uh, very similar. Um, I'm, a, I'm an alumni of uh, University of London. I studied in uh, SOAS um, back in the 1980s. And uh, at that time, SOAS was an extremely right-wing, um, to some extent, racist institution. And uh, I always remember the first um, lecture, which was um, went something like this. The reason that Africa was not developed um, or was not developing was primarily because um, uh, it wasn't exploited enough. And I spent a two weeks, I think, in the library trying to figure out which part of Marxism uh, this came from and then discovered that it was actually a, uh, an earlier Marx, who Karl Marx, who basically had the sense that everywhere in the world had to go from one um, epoch to another and that Africa, because it was disrupted by imperialism, would never uh, get to that point. Um, 
So, you know, I, I start off with this very conservative education. I have now been told severally that uh, SOAS is probably one of the most radical institutions on the planet at the moment. I'm probably exaggerating for those of you who are a bit closer, but I guess what um, I'm struck by really is, is the shift that has happened within um, African academics uh, or Afri African academia and academia on Africa. And it really gives me a great pleasure to, to be able to just share some reflections from the work that I've been doing. Um, you know, over the last, uh, I guess, over the last um, uh, 10 years or so, um, since I left Oxfam and I was working primarily at an international level, I've been able to focus in uh, just on this, uh, you know, republic uh, that I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a native of. And um, I'm, I'm actually speaking to you from Nairobi, Kenya today. And what I've learned over the last 10 years is essentially that um, it is possible as an NGO activist, as a social justice activist, to be extremely um, active and visible at international levels and at regional levels. And I, I spent 10 years working with Oxfam um, on the African Union and I you know, pushed very hard, um, you know, African Union, progressive African Union conventions, standards on gender inequality, on governance, on uh, uh, universal health care and, and various other, um, uh, you know, issues, including um, the protocol on the rights of women in Africa. But it is possible to do all of that and be completely anonymous in your home country. And really what I'm going to share is a bit of a journey um, uh, and also, I guess, um, some thoughts that are now uh, fortunately written down in, in, a, in, a, in a format that's slightly longer than um, a tweet, uh, which has been really my main mode of communication um, uh, over the last 10 years or so. Uh, I wrote a book recently called um, Dialogue and Dissent, uh, A Country in Search of a Constitution. And as we published it, I was really present to really a decade of um, uh, of experiences very much, yes, within the Kenyan context, but um, in many ways, uh, many African countries um, could see themselves in the story that, um, uh, you know, is stranger than fiction, but actually to, to a large extent is a non-fiction um, uh, piece of writing. The main focus um, uh, of my presentation today um, is really you know, the extent to which constitutionalism rests on um, the, uh, the, the activeness or the, the, the power of active citizenship in very polarized, grossly unequal and unsafe worlds for the majority of Africans. And how the centrality of citizens' consciousness and citizens' agency in either protecting or uh, rather in creating and or protecting transformative constitutions is so critical. And my story, um, you know, uh, my story really starts in this conversation back in uh, on the 19th of January in 2015. That's six years ago, a few, you know, just a few days back. And um, a few of us walked onto a playground um, that was in danger uh, of being grabbed by the um, uh, by a neighbor. And it was a private hotel that was owned by the deputy president, extremely powerful um, individual um, and uh, a presidential candidate in these elections uh, in uh, August 2022. And we walked onto the playground to essentially support the school community, um, 800 pupils, um, several teachers and several parents to protect a two acre uh, playground. Over the next eight hours, we had one of the most intense moments of my life which was essentially um, facing down over 100 police officers with dogs, with tear gas, uh, uh, gas cylinders, um, and essentially ensuring that the interests of the hotel would not be allowed to excise this uh, playground from these 800 children in order to make way for a car park. And something in the country shook in that moment. And for many of us, um, uh, you know, many, many Kenyans still remember that. I still go into public space and they say, are you the guy that was being bundled into a police car after trying to protect um, a playground in the Langata Road uh, Primary School? And the hashtag for that is Occupy Playground. And I, I want to just start there because I think in many ways what I learned from that process was really that there are a number of walls and some of them are very personal, emotional walls. And, and some of them are very public structural walls that keep justice far away from the 
um, the, the horizon of millions and millions of Kenyans and millions of Africans. And that it's really these walls that we need to target and focus on to ensure that people um, are able to be equal under the law, that they have is the same access to law courts, to lawyers, um, and that their dignity and that their safety is really upheld um, by all governments across the continent. Let me step back a little bit and just give a bit of a context. So in Africa, we've seen at least four different ways of constitutions. We had the uh, constitutional orders that were handed down by the constitutions. I call them in Kiswahili, the Mitumba uh, constitutions, because these are constitutions that were secondhand. They were essentially uh, foisted on uh, African subjects by colonial powers. And many colonial governments started off with those constitutions. A series of waves um, over the 1960s, the 1970s, the 1980s, and the 1990s gave rise to what I call the fourth wave of constitutions. And these were the constitutions um, that began to look more seriously at enshrining expanded Bill of Rights, expanding social, economic, and cultural rights, but more importantly, also expanding um, freedoms of expression, association and assembly, and the right to a fair hearing, and the right to lawyers and, and medical treatment, and so on. And in many ways, Kenya is one of the most fascinating countries from that perspective. Over the last 40 to, well, let me get this right, over the last 60 years, and this is uh, probably where my um, uh, senior moment, senior, senile moment, came, no, did I say senior or senile? Anyway, both uh, moment comes from. Over the last 60 years, um, we have seen in the Kenyan context 24 amendments uh, to our constitution. And before the 2010 constitution, many of these amendments essentially dismantled any vestige of democratic space or civic space for people to be able to dissent to be able to protest or to be able to essentially define the, the, the nature of government uh, that uh, they wanted. In 2010, we got our constitution. And I, as I say in the book, we moved from a uh, country in search of a constitution. And for the next 10 years, from 2010 to 2022, for the next 20, 12 years, we essentially became a constitution in search of a country. And I think this is one of the things we could discuss a little bit. How is it that constitutions have become these sites of contestation, not just in Kenya, but elsewhere in Africa? Um, and how is it that, you know, in almost two or three generations, Africans have gone from being subjects to being citizens with direct representation? In the context of the Kenyan, in the context of Kenya, our constitutional article one states that not only are we citizens with with a representational, um, uh, uh, with representatives in uh, the National Assembly, um, uh, but or representative government, but we are essentially citizens who are sovereign. We are citizens that have direct agency in and about our in and in in ourselves, and also we have the capacity to essentially defend the constitution. And this is written into the Kenyan constitution. But I guess if you look to the constitution and you spent, you know, just a couple of hours looking at the, the news that comes out of Kenya. The first thing that you would probably come to is how can the gap be so large between the constitutional vision and the contextual reality that millions of Kenyans experience on a daily basis? And I think what we have seen in the last two years, particularly this period of COVID-19, has been that you know the fault lines of corruption the fault lines of inequalities, and I use that word in plural specifically, and the fault lines of discrimination um, are essentially so deep that this virus, this miserable little virus that has occupied global attention and has killed you know, so many people across the world, that this miserable little virus didn't just come to disrupt um, uh, the political economy of countries like Kenya, it actually came to solidify and, and essentially allow for um, these greater fault lines, these greater viruses of corruption, inequalities and discrimination to, to essentially grip the country even more hard, uh, more tightly. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, in terms of our experience um, in terms of human rights organizing around five policy tensions. And the first tension relates to the 
the legal uh, or the legislative approach that African governments have taken to um, uh, responding to COVID-19. Some countries like South Africa issued a state of emergency to deal with the, um, I guess what there's the secession or the restriction of public liberties um, in, in order to fight uh, COVID-19. Kenya, on the other hand, chose to go through uh, the use of the Public Health Act and essentially invoked a section of the act that said that in the case of a pandemic or an epidemic, um, the Ministry of Health could invoke certain measures that would include the following. And we've seen these happen across um, the, the last two years. So the first thing was that movement would be interrupted and there would be a secession of movement from different parts of the country uh, to other parts of the country to ensure that the virus didn't get transported in the bodies of Kenyans moving back and forth. The second thing that was announced was that there would be a curfew. And for several years, for two years almost, um, we went from you know, a 12 hour to a 16 hour curfew that ensured that people could not leave their homes. Like everywhere in the world, else in the world, we were forced to wear masks in public. And thirdly, and fourthly, uh, fourthly that is, we saw the uh, closure of uh, public entertainment and other facilities um, to ensure that people could not gather in spaces that would lead to the proliferation of the virus. Now, why I think this is really important is because um, for those of us that campaigned essentially for a public health approach to the, pan the pandemic, rather than a state of emergency approach, was this has allowed us to avoid the dangers of over-militarization. Now, this doesn't mean that um, Kenya did not experience the kind of violence and uh, police brutality that we've seen all over the world. But in the case of Kenya, we were able to use the constitution and various laws to essentially um, push back against curfew related violations. And in the case of Kenya, many of these violations were essentially projected or rather propelled not by any public health concern, but really by extortion bribery um, the, that was being carried out by police officers under the uh, pretext that they were essentially enforcing COVID-19 regulations. The second thing that we could do is that we could continue to push for um, freedom of expression. We could continue to push for freedom of assembly. Uh, and in many cases, we were able to organize uh, protests against police brutality um, that would not have been possible if there had been um, a, a state of emergency um, uh, called to deal with the COVID. And I think this is the first policy tension that for us um, was very important as human rights organizers. The second was, uh, was, was really the tension between the relentless infrastructural development and the investment in infrastructure, roads, uh, railways, and uh, other um, forms of public uh, infrastructure versus the need for people to stay at home. And I want to give you this uh, very graphically because it affects um, thousands, tens of thousands of people across Kenya that during the uh, pandemic were forcibly be evicted from their homes to make way for large upgrading um, uh, projects of roads and railways. Um, we did a study as Amnesty International back in, uh, we released a study back in 2021, January, um, on the back of a very vicious uh, eviction of a Nubian community in Kisumu County um, that affected 3,000 people. Um, and what uh, we pointed out was that um, there is a complete ridiculousness in calling uh, for people to stay at home, when at the same time you are bulldozing people's homes, many of them people from informal settlements, uh, in fact, in most cases, uh, primarily from informal settlements. These are people who live under, you know, one pound a day. Uh, they are living in um, fairly uh, humble uh, shacks, um, many of them six by six feet um, housing. There may be a family in those spaces, and many of them did not have uh, the luxury of water and sanitation um, that came with the instructions, first of all, to stay at home, and then secondly, to wash their hands um, regularly. And I think the, 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 this tension has been a really important tension for many of us. Um, and for human rights organizing, one of the things that we had to do 
um, was immediately called for a, a moratorium on all forced evictions, which um, was not universally or 100% successful. But in many cases, what it did is it restricted the capacity of the state to remove people from their homes and their communities at a time when the pandemic was raging, and in particular at a time when the Delta variant was having most impact um, on communities across uh, Kenya. The second, ten the third tension relates to the issue of safety versus violence. Now, like many other places in the world, um, Kenya saw an upsurge of violence and mental health challenges, and many of that um, came from um, essentially the 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 mental uh, health challenges of being isolated and unable to um, to essentially carry on um, with what um, is you know what defines us as human beings. I mean, we are defined as human beings by our love of liberty, by our love of um, being able to engage with other human beings. And for many people, um, this clampdown, first of all, brought people back into their homes for longer periods than they had. And not only were they brought back into their homes for those periods, but many of them lost jobs. We saw upwards of about 2 million people lose their jobs during COVID-19. Um, we saw schools close for months and children have to go through um, as homeschooling or at least online learning in their homes. And it was without, you know, it was fairly predictable that in that context, gender-based violence would go up by 40%. Mental health would and suicide uh, rates would essentially skyrocket over this period. And I think one of the challenges that we had during this period, and we had to think carefully about how to do this, was really how do we get access to people, particularly between those hours in which the curfew was operational, those hours where people um, were in their homes and couldn't get either to the police station because there were roadblocks um, that prevented them. And essentially, um, many of those roadblocks were violent and um, would leave people unable um, to safely get access um, to uh, either paralegal support or to uh, get access to, um, uh, you know, to hospitals and healthcare facilities. So one of the most interesting things in that period was the different things, uh, the different strategies the human rights organizations developed. And this included, for example, uh, localized civic leadership joint patrols with their police officers. One of my favorite um, uh, superheroes of this period, and literally uh, there should be a Marvel movie made about this woman, is uh, Mama Fat uh, Halima, who works for the Kia Michael uh, Social Justice Center. And she, she basically spent um, days and nights walking with police officers and found that in doing that, levels of violence came down and levels of um, aggression from the community towards the police. In many communities, police are seen as a uh, occupying uh, force, a violent force, and therefore communities were primed to attack police officers, um, in some ways letting off steam against the uh, the impact of the curfew more broadly. Um, but we also saw some really nice touching moments. I mean, I one of my vivid moments was being invited to speak online to a class um, of um, uh, pre-teenagers, and uh, they uh, they had a polite policing project that they had developed over this period, and it was provoked by the death of a young boy called Yasin Moyo, who was shot on his balcony around about the time that uh, George Floyd um, uh, was killed. Uh, the experience of Yasin Moyo was really quite a you know horrific one for many Kenyans, and this was a young boy. He was out on his balcony three or four fl uh, fl flights up and a police officer uh, with um, you know with a torch basically shot him um, in uh, the presence of his mother and sister and brother um, and he died instantly um, and the children saw this on television and as amnesty rose to protest this and to call for justice for Yasin Moyo um, their parents found my telephone number and asked me to come and speak to them and they they had created this polite policing project as their equivalent um, to uh, advice to the police um, to become much more human rights based in the way that they police. And they did two things in that moment. I spent 45 minutes with them. The first thing they did was they wrote letters to the family, uh, to the, the mother and the father of Yasin Moyo, and expressed their solidarity as 
largely in, the, in this case, middle-class children reaching across from Kilimani to Kiamaiko, um, a informal settlement um, uh, with several, you know, um, uh, you know, for several uh, indices of poverty and uh, uh, and vulnerability, and they they wrote solidarity letters. The second thing that they did is they wrote letters to the Inspector General of the National Police Service. And I had the opportunity to read the letters publicly on national television um, uh, to the uh, police spokesperson. And I, you know, I'm always left by the capacity of, um, you know, humanity to rise up um, and call out injustice. Um, and, 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 you know, in this case, you know, that sometimes we infantilize uh, children, uh, and I use that slightly ironically, but you know, we, we we tend to infantilize children to the extent that we don't think that they can make the distinction between right and wrong, and that they cannot have agency themselves. Um, and and for me, this was just another example, like those children back in Langata Road Primary School that rose to protect their school, um, that they can actually uh, reach out and make those connections. So I think this is the third, um, I guess, tension that's there. The last tension, uh, the fourth tension, I think that I wanted to talk a little bit about was the um, the powerful uh, tension between local activism and local injustices and international solidarity and international justice movement building. One of the most powerful moments, I think, on the uh, planet um, during uh, the COVID-19 was really the global mobilization around George Floyd and the killing of George Floyd. It, it reverberated not just in terms of the United States of America, across the different states of America, led by the Black Lives Matter movement, but it, it, it reverberated in places like the UK. But here in Kenya, um, despite the 9,000 kilometers distance, as a result of this digital connectivity that we now have that is available for those of us that can see that there is no difference between a police officer stepping on the neck of a black man in uh, Minnesota, or a police officer shooting an unarmed boy in uh, the uh, you know the dense informal settlements of Kiamichael, Nairobi, um, it gave us the capacity to be able to see each other as activists in this struggle together. And the racial reckoning that's now in the United States of America, um, what has reverberated in conversations around inclusion, diversity, um, and also the issues of, inequal of equalities um, uh, across different identities. And in Kenya, how that showed up was a series of flash mob um, protests organized by Kenyans, by African-Americans who live in Kenya, and by Africans, um, uh, by Africans across the continent. What was wonderful, one of the most poignant moments for me was really being able to take that energy and bring it very forcefully into the, um, I guess, the boardrooms of policymaking. And I think for me, the other lesson um, that came from that moment and came from international solidarity is, is how important it is for us to be able to connect our struggles uh, and be able to draw lessons from what has worked. And whether it be the conversations around defunding the police, whether it be the conversations about police reforms more generally, whether it be issues about um, essentially having more civilian oversight and um, uh, uh, I guess governance um, over the police and uh, you know the the other law enforcement agencies or the armed um, uh, institutions of our state, um, these are all really important um, activism questions. But they are also research questions. And I think what I would want to leave you with, um, you know, after we when we come to the end of this presentation is really how important it is for us to be able to see these as research questions, really not research questions that end in an inquiry, but really give some clarity about what's possible, uh, what's transformatively possible for the future. I think the other thing that, um, you know, showed up for me in terms of the international solidarity has been really the, um, the global misjustice with regards to the inequalities around vaccine access. Um, 400 years ago, European powers were bending over backwards to essentially uh, abduct and forcibly transport African labor to the Caribbean, to other parts of the world, to the new, uh, to the new Americas, as they used to call it. Um, and what, 
what an interesting, really horrific moment we have gone through in the last one and a half years, where essentially we have seen certain countries hoard vaccines, um, bend um, uh, pharmaceutical companies, um, prevent African governments from even buying vaccines. It's not that we need charity handouts, but where governments wanted to buy vaccines, they just simply weren't available because very, um, uh, very powerful contracts had been written um, that ensured that those vaccines that were available for purchase were essentially uh, bought by the Global North and the Global South would have to be reliant or dependent on essentially uh, the COFAX option that came out of uh, the, uh, the vaccines that were being manufactured in one country, namely in India. And what happened when India needed the vaccine for itself, Africa was left. So we have this really ridiculous, um, you know, really unjust scenario now where one part of the world has vaccinated even up to 80, 90 percent of its population is now thinking about going beyond adults to children and boosters um, and perhaps even uh, thinking about their domestic pets. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but when the rest of the world has not even reached 15 percent vaccination. And I think we need to interrogate these issues. We need to bring intellectually uh, rigorous methods to challenge this essentially a syncrasy between the rich and the poor countries of the world and challenge this. Let me end um, with a couple of thoughts around what I've learned as an activist. You know, um, Duncan started uh, by talking a little bit about uh, the experience in Cancun. I think Cancun was uh, something like 2000 and ooh, let me date ourselves, both of us. Um, I think it was something like 2003. Um, if I've not got that right, if I got that right, yes. Um, you know, 10 years of activism in the international and the continental space, as I said, you know, gave me a fairly good sense of um, organizing for human rights across the continent in the world, uh, in the world summits, whether it be the UN, uh, WTO, the uh, WHO summits, but also at the continental level in the African Union and various other African regional in institutions. But one of the things I learned that morning um, of 19th January 2015, as we walked onto that playground, is that justice, that, you know, constitutionalism is essentially um, cemented by the activism of people in very local contexts, right? Um, and that if we are not actively claiming space, expanding civic space, as well as challenging the abuse of power, that we are not really going to be able to build the kind of uh, planet that is able to be a match for the fine words that exist, whether it be in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or whether it be in international human rights standards and um, conventions or whether it be at the continental level. Um, and that the, the work is primarily local with an eye to the global um, best practices and the global best standards of human rights. And there are four things that I think, you know, have become really clear for me in the last, um, you know, 10 years. And the first is this, that we have to think beyond the binaries of us and them. As human rights uh, activists, we fall very easily into a number of fault lines. And these mindsets are essentially, in many ways, prisons um, that do not allow us to advance and, and expand, um, I guess, power in favor of, of just uh, causes. The first is that there are no good people and bad people. There are simply people that take, that have uh, good or bad actions that have negative or positive consequences. And therefore thinking about human rights work as first of all, anti-state, and secondly, caught within the prism of international human rights standards rather than domestic political economic realities is essentially the first uh, block or um, uh, you know uh, uh, block in terms of our vision i have had more success working with internal reformers sometimes than external public uh, human rights activists that are stuck between this us and them framework 
the second, uh, and therefore, let me just uh, finish that thought. I think, therefore, thinking in terms of where are the cracks within the state that allow us to produce the kind of victory that we saw in the case of protecting schools from land grabbing um, become really important. Let me just give you um, the end of the story uh, to that uh, land grab back in 2015. In 2020, um, the president of the Republic of Kenya, in his national address, um, to the nation, in his national address, stated that no less than 14,000 schools had received title deeds and therefore were protected against land grabbing um, between this period of 2015 and 2022. That one really basic, a very micro action to protect um, that school spawned a movement of schools, communities, with the Lands Ministry, with the National Land Commission, with other authorities, and a civic alliance called the Shuleangu Alliance to actually lead to the titling of 14,000 schools. Now, if that is not a very vivid example of what is possible when you think across the us and them, and you begin to see this as an ecosystem with complexity and with reformists on one side and activists on the other side, and a common cause that can be generated between them, I can't think of another better example. The second um, lesson, the second thought, um, you know, that I thought was, was that kind of bubbled up as I was preparing for this session tonight, is really how fragile the human rights um, movement is, particularly in this, in this period. You know, we now have probably on the continent four generations of human rights organizations. We have the initial human rights organizations that were essentially non-governmental organizations funded by 100% um, funded by um, the international development assistance uh, industry. Um, many of them were focused primarily on civil and political liberties. This was a time when the state, it was the time of the one party state. Um, the, the freedom of expression was non-existent um, and the right to protest was essentially a jail uh, an op uh, what do you call it, a, a, a get, get into jail um, free card. Um, the second generation were the human rights organization that began to look at issues around economic, cultural and social rights. And I remember this from the 1990s as I was just coming into the sector at that point. And we had a campaign uh, at the time when I was working for, for ActionAid, which we call the basic rights, basic needs are basic rights campaign. And we began to articulate the, the right to water, the right to health, the right to education. And it, what's interesting about that is we were doing it at a time when Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch were still debating whether these were justiciable and actually were important rights. We had, a, in the Kenyan context, we had actually begun to articulate this very uh, clearly. And it's, some of that work found its way into the 2010 co uh, constitution. But that was the second wave. Um, and the third wave, re began to develop around the idea of, um, you know, kind of identity-based rights, the rights of, uh, in the early days, the rights of indigenous people, the rights of women, the rights of youth, the rights of, of children and disability rights. And then more recently, you have seen the beginnings of a new movement um, around um, sexual identity and sexual choices. Um, and this is essentially is the LGBTIQ plus communities who are beginning to argue that they too have a right to marriage. They too have a right to dignity. They too have the right to jobs and to live in any communities as sexual minorities. And I think for me, this is one of the most interesting new movements that we have to support and, 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 and encourage um, essentially across the continent. And we have seen some great um, you know, successes in places like Botswana, in places like South Africa. Um, and I think you know, this is, is the, the fourth a generation. But I think I would continue to argue that despite all this mature, maturation um, and this growth in, in the, the diversity of human rights on the continent, one of the things that we have to recognize is that, you know, the NGO as a mode of organization, as a mode of organizing is really, um, I think, at a point of expiry. I think the levels of funding to human rights organizations generally have begun to drop. Um, proposals are essentially, 
projects um, uh, rather than programmatic funding or institutional funding. And, and as I said to many um, heads of mission, heads of diplomatic missions and development agencies, um, whenever I get the chance, I'm, not, I'm no longer interested in you funding projects, human rights projects, however interesting they are. I'm now asking you to fund independent organizations that can defend human rights and can defend democracy. And the only way that you can do that is to give us the resources for us to build assets and to build an, uh, a financial portfolio that is, first of all, diverse, it is sufficient, and thirdly, it is based on very sound economic principles that everybody else is using. Um, you know, whether it be uh, essentially investment in financial markets, investment in real estate, the ability to generate surplus from merchandise and other, um, uh, you know, for sale services that we can provide. But I think the issue of financial resilience is probably the most um, pressing issue for those of us who have spent the last 30 years working in this space um, from the NGO as a model of organizing. But underneath that, I think what's interesting is the emergence of social justice community-based organizations that are not waiting for donors to fund proposals. They are essentially tapping into the community resources um, to be able to deal with very localized human rights related problems, whether it be domestic violence, whether it be uh, forced evictions, whether it be um, uh, extrajudicial killings or enforced disappearances of young men or criminal suspects um, uh, by police officers. And I think this is the second um, area of, of, of preoccupation. I think that anybody who's looking at the human rights world now needs to focus on. The third one is really how do we balance the work that needs to take place in the policy boardrooms, the places where decisions are made that affect millions and millions of people, and the spaces in the informal settlements, the urban, highly dense informal settlements, and the rural villages in which the majority of our peoples who are denied dignity, who are denied um, basic and essential services, who are denied the right to be able to participate in policy formulation. How do we bridge these two spaces? And I think for me, this is the other area that really as, as somebody working within probably one of the uh, largest human rights organizations in Kenya today, um, as Amnesty International Kenya, we've been working in this country for, um, at least legally, we've been working in this country for about 10 years, uh, but have a 20 year history of protecting human rights and essentially protecting prisoners of conscience. Um, but we are, we are extremely well funded. We have a budget of about a million uh, pounds per annum. We have 18 staff. We have uh, 2,000 members across the country, um, 20,000 supporters across the country. Um, we, have a, we, we operate from a position of privilege. And really, the, the conversation that I have been generating with my colleagues, with members, and with my board is really how do we place this at the service of communities? How do we ensure? that communities are able to generate um, chapters and circles of conscience that are self-actualizing, um, that are self-driven, um, you know, and that are essentially visible and vocal and are able to keep power and privilege accountable at very local levels, whether it be at the level of a ward, um, which typically would be in, a, in an area that has about 40,000 to 100,000 people, or at the level of a county, which is the second uh, major unit um, uh, that Kenya works in, which I guess would be like the equivalent of a borough in the UK, perhaps, um, and of course, nationally. So I'm going to stop here because I do want us to have discussion. I do want us to have some, uh, you know, some provocation and uh, uh, thank you all for listening to me. And really, once again, um, you have given my, uh, my family no end of pride that I could be speaking on Houghton Street today, uh, all the way from Nairobi. Over to you, Duncan. Thanks, Irungu. And embarrassingly, I never connected Houghton and Houghton. I can't believe I didn't do that. Um, that what a, well, that was a fantastic insider take on the kind of challenges and evolution of human rights activism uh, in Africa and elsewhere. Um, over to Chaloka. For a commentary and think about for those online uh, and those in, in in the marshall building think about the questions you want to ask because it's first come first served and what we normally get in these situations is that people are shy they come on late and then they don't get called if you get in early you definitely get your question in 
So if you want your moment in, in uh, fame, start thinking about your question now. Chaloka, over to you. Okay, uh, here I am. Thank you very much, Duncan. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Arungu, for quite, um, you know, it's, it's an expose, it's a milestone. So I really don't know where to start uh, and where to end. Uh, but except that, you know, I have shared some of the journey that Irungu has expressed uh, this evening. So paths have crossed. Um, and perhaps that's where I should start that, you know, in the journey to advocacy uh, for human rights, um, constitution making, COVID, and other aspects, Irungu has left visible footprints uh, on his journey that are easy to see and to follow. Um, and I think that from my point of view, it's really the impact of advocacy that matters. Uh, human rights started as a movement, as an international movement, um, from the International Labor Organization uh, throughout um, to the involvement of um, the former First Lady of the United States in trying to have human rights in the UN Charter. Um, and I think that the greatest uh, risk to human rights is it has become a professional preoccupation uh, rather than a something that has to be fought for uh, at all times. And I think that this is the real merit of what uh, Irungu uh, has brought to us uh, in his uh, lecture this evening. He has spoken about the extent to which constitutionalism uh, clearly rests on powers of activism. Um, and we were involved in uh, the constitution of Kenya. We, we exchanged uh, views, uh, and I'm of the view that the constitution of Kenya itself was a product of activism and advocacy. You know, without that, it would not have happened. Uh, because on the one hand, the amendments that you spoke of over 60 were a product of the thinking of minimum reforms that had always driven their approach to the constitution, but much more reforms that were geared at uh, serving the elite uh, against uh, the grain of the argument for comprehensive constitutional reform uh, based on the interests of the people and hence uh, the sovereignty of the people. So constitutions have become arenas for contestation in Africa because they're really about reconfiguring the African state and making it more relevant uh, to the people uh, and trying to reform it from the vertical colonial uh, imposed structure that it was and African leaders are embracing the state at that time and not knowing that the state was actually in need of reform and had to be rebuilt afresh in order to be relevant uh, to the people that they were going to, to lead. So the sovereignty of the people is a direct agency and why sovereignty matters is that constitutionalism, the views of rights, the legitimacy of governments are based on the extent to which they are correlated um, to the people and what the people need. This then becomes the entry point uh, in relation to, to COVID. I think the one thing that COVID did, and not just in Africa, but elsewhere, is that it called for the relevance of the state more than ever uh, to the people um, completely, to show its preparedness to take measures on grounds of public health um, in order to protect uh, not just the citizens, uh, but humanity, uh, I think, as a global uh, entity uh, and collection. But in doing this, we have seen the state, I think, respond in ways that are actually autocratic, uh, in ways that uh, brought the authority of the state to bear on the people uh, in ways that had not been contemplated before. Um, I, I recall the curfew scenes uh, in Kenya and South Africa at the beginning and India as well, of police physically beating up people rather than guiding people or discussing with people. And in one of those scenes that I saw, um, people who had broken the curfew were then shepherded to a room and all packed in one room, which made conditions for the spread of COVID <laughs> actually much more uh, potential than simply saying, please go home and this space uh, and, and you get home safely. So the, the, the correlation between 
the relevance of the state and the way in which the state uh, behaved in relation to uh, its people uh, brought out the more autocratic aspects of the state, not just in Africa, but I think globally, uh, almost everywhere. It's a question of degree uh, on the extent to which that would be. I'll come back to the public health approach in terms of human rights um, and the use of the constitution to protect public laws, um, to, pub to protect uh, public health uh, as, as, as well as the people. Uh, and I think this is what is contemplated by the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, but I'll leave that uh, towards the end. The basis for dissent, obviously, um, freedom of association, assembly, the basis for social, political, cultural organization of people uh, as a people, uh, quite distinct from the state, uh, is anchored in those rights. Uh, and indeed, I think the Kenyan constitution goes so far as to recognize the right to strike uh, in certain circumstances as, as a way of building the bedrock uh, for dissent and, and making uh, points that matter to the people uh, in relation to, to the state itself. You met very clear points about um, tensions, um, the legislative approach, states of emergency, um, curfews versus public health uh, approaches. Uh, and here I, I did a piece on principles applicable uh, to COVID um, in the context of human rights uh, at some point in time. It's quite clear that the declaration of states of emergency has not complied with the requirements of a state of emergency and the international human rights law. Um, in particular, issues of the exigencies of the situation that require a state of emergency, the proportionality of the measures taken in that regard, including safeguards on notification, um, and also the application of blanket bans in terms of travel internally or internationally, um, which a state of emergency in terms of proportionality uh, would not actually allow. But states took advantage uh, of invoking these measures uh, because of the fact that A, the population was looking up to the state, and B, there was quite fear and risk on the part of the population uh, because of COVID and information was scarce, not much flow of information from the state on how to deal with COVID, uh, in the early days and, and towards the end. Uh, self versus violence and what defines us as human beings. Um, you know, clearly the question of safety, humanity, uh, here comes um, first and foremost. Uh, and bearing in mind, um, you know, the, the whole issue um, of humanity as a first point of call. But yes, gender-based violence increased. Um, I think if, even in the UK, if you saw the report that was released yesterday, they say it was about 60% increase in gender-based violence uh, during the, um, you know, the, 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 the COVID period. Uh, and to have to use COVID or the framework of COVID or the atmosphere of COVID um, as a kind of uh, framework for uh, infrastructure investment uh, evict individuals in circumstances where eviction adds further risks uh, to them catching COVID. Uh, and Kenya, surprising, uh, because as you know, uh, you refer to the eviction of the Nubian community, uh, but there are two important decisions by the African Commission against Kenya. Well, one by the African Commission and the other by the African Court uh, on the subject of evictions, the Endoris case, um, the Ogik case by the uh, African Court uh, on Human and People's Rights, both of which say that the eviction of these communities, which happened in the 1970s, was actually unlawful, uh, and they should be restored back to where they were uh, and given compensation uh, as a result of, uh, of that. Towards the end, I think there are issues about territorial approaches versus global approaches to a pandemic. Most of the measures taken by states as if the pandemic is territorial and only operates within their territorial boundaries. Forgetting that a pandemic uh, actually has an international dimension and is a global phenomenon. So one part of the world is likely to get affected by another part of the world, depending on what is done or what is neglected. Uh, 
So concentrating on the issue of vaccines on a territorial basis um, without looking at other states, other people outside of the state has called more for leaders wanting to receive political legitimacy and instrumentalizing COVID for political reasons rather than addressing COVID as an international pandemic that required uh, to be addressed um, in that particular uh, regard. You know, on the question of vaccines, only the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights from a human rights perspective called on states in the Americas to prioritize public health, comply with international uh, human rights obligations when making decisions, uh, especially as regards purchase, distribution, and provide equitable access to vaccines. I think that's a message that the rest of the world um, you know, does need. To try and end up and, and not take too much time, I then get back to what I did say uh, about um, economic, social, and cultural rights. Uh, and the issue um, of COVID uh, in these circumstances. Um, I think it's the, the covenant on economic, social and cultural rights recognizes the importance of steps to be taken by states to achieve the full realization of this right and include measures necessary for the prevention, treatment and control of, control of epidemics uh, endemics, occupational, and other diseases, which include um, pandemics. And in this regard, the covenant obviously establishes the test of necessity uh, in respect of the rights to health, and which is why, at least however haphazard uh, the Kenyan approach was, but anchoring it in the right to health uh, is the best approach to take from the point of view uh, of human rights. And this also corroborates the necessity uh, of the requirement um, with regards to how public health measures taken from the perspective of those rights uh, impinge on civil and political rights from the point of view uh, of indivisibility. So the argument here is not one dimensional as some states have uh, sought to, to put it. On the one hand, public health response must inform the nature of the restrictions uh, on human rights based on public health needs such as COVID-19 situational assessment, testing, pressing, isolation, quarantine, while also clearly maintaining public health capacity to cope with the caseloads of COVID and creating conditions that would assure to medical service and medical attention to all those in need in the event of COVID-19 sickness. On the other hand, having informed uh, restrictions on human rights, um, clearly should be the basis for determining the legality of restrictions on human rights and not the other way round. So in conclusion, with better knowledge and understanding of the spread and mutation of COVID, there must be a shift to more qualitative medically assessed conditions on its gravity, um, its variants, um, country of origin and country of destination situation. Um, the issues related to uh, public gatherings, isolation or quarantine. And of course, there should also be uh, on the agenda, the conditional easing of restrictions uh, or completely uh, as the pandemic um, allows uh, in certain instances. Um, you know, we see that this has not been the case uh, at all. Uh, in Uganda, children were out of school for two years, you know, completely. Uh, the case you had continued um, in all these two years. Um, the question of elections and electoral democracy was also affected by COVID. Some countries wanted to postpone elections on account of COVID. Others used COVID restrictions and measures to constrain the political space <laughs> to the opposition. Uh, I end there. I could say a lot more, but this is... Uh, clearly, um, in, with total respect uh, to Irungu, uh, his work in human rights uh, over the years uh, that I have known him and he has remained principled uh, in that regard and, and completely committed uh, to that task. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chelok, for very helpful uh, insights there. Um, so we've got a couple of questions and then I'm going to do the classic chair thing of sticking in my own question and abusing chair's position. Um, otherwise, why do this, right? 
And then uh, please think of your own questions as well. So we're going to first go to the enigmatic Kristen's iPad, um, which is the only details we have of her identity. Then we're going to Rowan Williams. So Kristen's iPad, could you come on mic and on camera, please, and ask your question? Nice. <laughs> oh my, you've got a phenomenal echo as well. Uh, those, those are gadgets. <laughs> do, you, do you want me to read it out, Kristen's iPad? There's a gadget open somewhere. I think it's Kristen's. So do you want to, I'm going to read Kristen's question because I think when she puts the iPad on, we get um, lots of feedback, uh, if that's okay with people. Um, here we go. So Kristen's question. Sorry, Kristen. Do you mind? Are you okay? I'm going to ask your question. Kristen's question is, Mr. Houghton, you mentioned that the mode of functioning by NGOs is expiring. I thought someone would pick this up. Uh, as a lead figure as an INGO, at least in the, yeah, what do you see as the way forward for NGOs and INGOs? It's a nice, easy question to begin with. We're going to have three questions, so don't jump in. We're going to have three questions first. Um, Rowan, see if you have any more luck with the mic. Hi there. Um, so yes, thank you, um, Irungu, for such a fascinating lecture. So um, yes, as I said in the chat, um, I spent some time living and working in Kenya in 2019. And um, I would say most of the people that I know from that experience are pretty critical of the government and the corruption there, but um, see Uhuru Kenyatta himself as quite a a principal politician who's surrounded by corrupt actors and is sort of doing his best to make the situation better. Um, and I was personally a bit skeptical of that view, but it seemed to be pretty common um, amongst people of all different ages and tribes and things like that. Um, so yeah, do you think that President Kenyatta's public image is an obstacle to rights being better protected in Kenya? Okay, thanks Ryan. And, and my question is um, coming out of some research I've been involved with in a project called Emergent Agency in a time of COVID, looking at how social movements and NGOs have responded to COVID. And one of the big picture things we've seen across many countries is uh, civil society organizations actually moving from advocacy into direct needs, into actually feed, getting people fed, getting medicines to them, looking after people who got sick. And that is seen as actually rekindling their legitimacy in the eyes of the public. So uh, I'd just be interested in whether you, that's what you've seen and whether you think there'll be a move back into advocacy with a bit more political clout than happened in, before when they became a bit professionalized as advocates. What's the dynamics of that move between advocacy and what's technically called service delivery? So there's three questions to get started with. A great, great question. So let me start with Kirsten. I think the, the, uh, I think the model has run its course. I think um, it was essentially dependent on um, uh, foreign, de you know, development assistance. I think that assistance is increasingly less. I find myself having conversations um, that are more political and foreign policy related than um, the power of development assistance um, with uh, ambassadors. Um, more and more, this is the case. Um, and uh, the, as I said, the 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 the, the amount of funding is com that's coming through is 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 reducing dramatically. Um, uh, very few organizations can think three years ahead. Um, many of them are thinking in terms of only one year contracts for staff. Um, uh, you know, I, I have this example of one of our best um, uh, legal uh, uh, public interest litigation organizations called Katiba Institute. They're wonderful. They, they take on, you know, 15 to 25 uh, constitutional cases um, at a time. And uh, one of the things that their director told me was that, you know, one of the difficulties they have is that many organizations reach out to them and say, could you work on this issue? And it could be, for example, even uh, indigenous people's rights. And uh, by the time that they, um, they get a, a judgment either in favor or against um, the petition, um, the organization that had been funded to that work no longer has funding um, to report on it. Um, they've moved on to a different topic. They've, uh, they're now moving on to other issues. And, um, the, the sad thing is that there's not even a space to go back. The, the, the donor is not even interested in the fact that the investment that was there for a year, four years later, has generated this wonderful uh, constitutional precedence and jurisprudence um, uh, because they've moved on as well, right? So this is just the example. I think, therefore, um, there are two models that I'm, I'm now intimately interested in. Uh, 
One is the, the foundation model, this idea that um, uh, you have an institution that is not for profit, but it is surplus generating and it is consciously building up assets. One of the things that one of the one of the most, um, I guess, the most serious weaknesses of non-governmental organizations is that they are essentially um, uh, complex ATMs. Um, essentially, what happens is you, you know, they, they are, you know, they're replenished with money. You write a proposal, you get the money, you spend the money down to 10% of the budget. If you go 10% over or 10% under of the budget, you're penalized for it. And then you write another proposal, you get more money and, you know, just the circle continues. But actually you are penalized and it is not, you are, it's frowned upon for you to begin to develop independent reserves. Yet we talk about financial sustainability the whole time. So I think the community foundation or the foundation uh, with an endowment, with uh, assets and significant resources is one model. The second one, and then not necessarily exclusive, is an association model. Um, one of the uh, power, you know, I think the most powerful um, feature of Amnesty International is that essentially um, the fact that we have 10 million supporters globally um, that can be called upon to write letters to any dictator across the, uh, across the world. Um, and we have people who give regularly, which means that we can stick our noses up at any government and declare that we actually don't want government funding. Um, and I think that, for me, is the power that uh, could be translated down to the national level and down to communities, that if you had constituencies of people that says, I am willing to pay a subscription um, on a regular basis, um, however little it is or however large it is, um, what you have there is not just warm capital, but you have domestic influence and domestic accountability. And I think that's, for me, the, the most interesting thing about the associational model. Let me turn to uh, Rohan's um, uh, comment. And I, I think there are a couple of things. I mean, I think the, the image of the beleaguered uh, president, the victim of the cartels, the victim of his cabinet, um, I think is somewhat disingenuous because I think it removes from Uhuru Kenyatta the power of him as a agent in as, as an as a change agent um uh, and I, you know i think we could we could go into his personality and what are his strengths and his weaknesses but i, I think the most important thing when we look at powerful leaders in a, in countries across the world is really that we have to stop looking at them from the prism of their intentions we have to also stop looking at them from the prism of their actions and we need to really be grounded in, in what is the impact of their actions or the omission of their actions or their, their lack of actions, right? And I, I find the most interesting discourse that I've had with um, elected or appointed leaders comes from the point of view of, let's just discuss not what you intended to do, not what you did, but what's the reality for the millions of people that you are responsible for carrying this or bearing this duty um, on behalf of. And I think that's the, the conversation that I've had. And I, I have had opportunities to look across a room from the president and challenge the levels of corruption um, that are in government um, at this uh, at, at the time, uh, you know, during his tenure um, as, a, as a president. I think the other second, the second element to this really is, is beginning to see this as, as an ecosystem and that there are very many actors involved in this, um, in propping up uh, corruption or um, you know, uh, elite capture uh, by, um, or rather state capture by elites. And I think um, what we have seen in many ways is that you can have very decent, and, and let me just put it this way, we, you know, in Kenya, we have some very decent, patriotic, um, highly technical, competent leaders um, in various levels of government, um, whether it be the executive, the judiciary, or the legislature. Um, but the, the, the thing that, you know, we have to deal with is really, what is it that leaves millions of keep people uh, disaffected, uh, mistrusting, and also um, rebellious against a government that says all the right things? And I think sitting inside the context um, of what is the impact of policy, what is the impact of its implementation is what is important rather than the personality um, or the personal intentions of, of leaders. And I, I hope that kind of helps um, situate uh, Uhuru Kenyatta within um, essentially his legacy as he comes into the last few years um, of his governance as, as a president.
In terms of Duncan, a brilliant, a lovely question. Uh, emergent, uh, and by the way, all the other questions were brilliant and lovely as well. Um, so let me not just uh, create a hierarchy there, but I am interested in this idea of emergent agency during COVID. And I, I just illustrate, it, uh, illustrate my response with two examples. Um, the first is, is a community foundation that I um, helped to set up with my wife and um, various other residents in a small community called Kilimani in Nairobi. And the community foundation now is in its 10 year. It's called the Kilimani Project Foundation. And our hashtag is uh, at Kilimani Speaks. And when, uh, when COVID-19 hit us, immediately there was a demand for, um, for information for um, leadership within the community. Uh, we were very concerned in the early days that we would perhaps go the way of some of the Asian um, countries in the sense that they would be immediately, um, you know, sanctions placed on people to leave their homes. And of course, uh, leaving your home and um, would stop you from being able to just get access to basic essential services to work and so on. So we set up a five point program um, uh, that was for the first time, much more service delivery oriented than um, it had ever been in the 10 years of our, uh, our you know, our, our lifespan as a community foundation. And, and one of the things that was really was was really interesting was really this idea that every street should have a marshal um, and that that marshal was responsible for being informed about uh, COVID-19, uh, where to get help. Um, what the vaccine, sorry, the, at that point there was no discussion of vaccine, um, what the mandatory quarantine facilities would be like, how to get um, transportation and emergency assistance to people who needed it if they were elderly or unhealthy, you know, uh, had issues with their health. The second thing that was really, um, really kind of uh, vivid still for me was really the experience of domestic workers um, on the streets of Kilimani. Uh, so Kilimani is, a, is kind of a, a lower to middle uh, class neighborhood um, and there are a number of um, women that come over from uh, the informal settlements of Kibra and uh, Kaungwari to look for work in our homes and they essentially uh, say, wash clothes, they wash, they clean homes, they uh, look after children. But during COVID-19, with the fear of COVID-19, um, many homes stopped taking in external domestic workers. So the numbers of domestic workers swelled dramatically. So at one point we had up to a hundred domestic workers on the streets, um, sitting on stones, essentially jobless and really frightened that their homes and their, um, their livelihoods were crashing around them. Many of them were uh, having experiences of rent distress um, and just putting food on the table for their families was a big issue. And I, I, I won't go on for this story too long, but it, it's really still vivid for me. Um, two things happened within a 24 hour period. The first was um, we heard that uh, the local police station had arrested 20 of these women for essentially stampeding um, well wishers who had stopped, uh, opened their bonnet, uh, sorry, their boot, and had begun to give food relief to these uh, women. So they were all arrested, taken down to the police station, and charged for um, failing to respect spatial um, distancing uh, regulations. And then they were put, all of them, 20 of them, in one cell, right? Um, within 24 hours, uh, sorry, I, uh, we heard about this, the community intervened, I went over to the police station, I pleaded, they were released without charge, um, and uh, they went home. And uh, the next day, uh, two or three days after, I get a phone call from the police, um, uh, the officer in charge of the police station. He says, Irongo, please come and get your people. I went there expecting to find another group of domestic uh, workers. This time I found fairly well-dressed um, uh, middle-class uh, residents. And I said, what have they done? And they said, we've arrested them for giving food to the hungry. And I turned around and looked at the police um, station uh, chief. And I said, listen, there is a very hot place reserved in hell for people who arrest people who are hungry and then arrest people who are trying to feed the hungry. And I, I, I don't know if you're a Christian, but I know where you're going if you don't stop this. And that generated a um, huge um, uh, weekly feeding program for domestic workers that went on for two months um, at the height of the uh, COVID-19. And it is that work that created the legitimacy for the Kilimani Project Foundation. So I think you're completely spot on with this. <coughs> Let me turn lastly to Amnesty. 
Amnesty has seen a 40% growth in our funding um, over this period and a 25% increase. Actually, no, sorry, I, I'm not there. A 60% increase in our membership over the last two years. Why? Because Not because we provided uh, services in the classic sense of education, water, and uh, food provision, but because we developed and consistently drove a rapid response program to police brutality, to forced evictions, um, to mandatory quarantine um, uh, you know, uh, facilities, to um, mandatory vaccination um, uh, guidelines, and I think what I've what I've got from that really is that as non-governmental organizations, as civic organizations, the more responsive you are to what is important to communities at a time when the state is essentially preoccupied with other issues, the more legitimacy you have to do advocacy. And I know, ironically, uh, Amnesty International Kenya and the Kilimani Project Foundation are much stronger having come through this period than before. I think I've uh, responded to the three. Great, and, and fully, <coughs> thank you, Irungu. Um, <laughs> okay, if it's okay with you, we've got a few more questions, and I'm worried we're gonna run out of time. So what I'd like to do is to go to the questions, then come to both of you to answer the questions, and then in that space, Chiloka, you can answer any of the previous questions. Is that okay with you? I think it's okay. Uh, Irungu here is the star of the show, and the questions are directed to him, so let him deal with them. That's very, <laughs> I'm, I'm just that's very, very yeah. generous of you. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have Kenya Mugaini, Francesco, uh, sorry, I didn't get the second name, and uh, one James Putzel. So, Kenya Mugaini, do you want to come on and ask your question? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. Um, so, my question is to Irungo. Uh, so it's about how Kenyan activists, how can we, as Kenyan activists, how can we go beyond the awareness that, for example, the issues that we speak about, how much awareness we get to get injustice. Because I was, I was giving you the example of like Yasin Moyo, the one you talked about. The last we heard is that the officer got like bail and he was told not to go see the families. And this was like in February 2021. And that was the end. Uh, in the Karyobangi ev evictions, they were given like a few months. And then after that, part of the slum was like was demolished. So then how do we go about making sure the things we we are speaking against actually last? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Francesco Fiorito, do you want to come on? Yeah, hopefully this works. Huh? Can, you, yep. can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, and I can see myself. Ew, that's weird. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask, in light of what uh, in what was said about uh, NGOs being not a viable um, organizational way for development aid to be delivered, and in light of the fact that a lot of the people in this department are looking for jobs in NGOs <laughs> at the moment, so I think it would be sort of curious for us to to sort of um, address the issue of what would be the new role of uh, Northern finance uh, donors and, and sort of multilateral development institutions if project-based development aid is replaced by uh, indigenous community-led development. Because I think that, yeah, I agree that there is a, a much more viable and more fair and less problematic way of delivering development, but then what is left you know, of this sort of paradigm of international development as we know it. Thanks, Francesco. Um, the questions always get bigger as we get towards the end. Um, James, <laughs> James, I'm going to um, uh, ask you to do family hold back because we have Wajia Khan's come in with a question which is along similar uh, lines to Francesco. So, Wajia, do you want to come online? Oh. You there, Wajia? Wajia Khan? No? All right, I'll read it out then. Um, question for Irungu. Uh, the point you made regarding local activism and international move movement building and solidarity. As an activist, how do you resolve the tension between the overload of issues arising from this digital connectivity, BLM to Palestine to Kashmir and now Yemen, among many others, and keeping them alive at the local and global level? 
um, to realize any measure of transformative and sustained change. With so many instances of human rights abuses occurring across the globe, the space has been inundated with far too many issues for each to receive adequate attention in the international arena. Additionally, I would like to hear your thoughts on what activists and civil society members can do in terms of a gender setting. Uh, oh yeah, they, and, and Rogia said, traveling and unable to turn my mic on. Sorry, I should have read that. Um, uh, yep, uh, so do you want to take those away? Uh, let's go to, actually, let's go to um, Chaloka first for any final thoughts, and then we'll come to uh, uh, James who can, I mean, sorry, Irungu who can uh, answer those and wrap up. Chaloka, would you like to come on mic? Yes. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I, I think Irunga has done justice to um, quite a good number uh, of the issues that have been um, raised. Uh, I would like to start from local activism and also international solidarity, which I think Irungu had raised in the context of um, the Black Lives Matter movement in relation to the killing of George Floyd. Um, and I think the one common thread that runs through there uh, is the exposure of police racial injustice. Again, that's not a coincidence. The way in which from the time of slavery, the US police were trained to react to black people and the way in which uh, the colonial police uh, whose traditions remain in Africa and elsewhere who <laughs> react to their own people are essentially the same. They are colonial tools. So if you then to expand this to what you asked question on how do you resolve the tension? Uh, first of all, I think there's some similarities, which is the recognition of injustice between the Black Lives Matter, the Palestinians, the Kashmiris who are denied their own statehood, you know, both the Palestinians and Kashmiris have one thing in common, that they can't function as a people with statehood as the basis for their independence, autonomy, or engagement uh, in international law. Whereas the Black Lives Matter, it's a question of oppression within their own states um, by police and others as instruments of power, uh, essentially. But if you then went into the tensions, um, the tensions also descend from that. On the one hand, um, you've got structures that you can at least address in the context of Black Lives Matter, George uh, Floyd was taken to account. Other police officers are also taken to account. Um, but when you go to Palestine, uh, you go to Yemen, you go to Kashmir, accountability there is lacking. So it, it's not surprising, for example, that the International Criminal Court has launched investigations into the situation in Palestine uh, in order to try and bring about accountability. So the real tension is accountability in the absence of accountability uh, on either side of the spectrum. That's just what I wanted to address. Thank you. Thank you, Chaloka. Yeah. Irungu, over to you. Okay. Three questions so, on our stirring final peroration. Yeah, great. So let me start with um, Kenya's great question. Um, so I think there are a number of things. Uh, so public awareness is critical. Let me not, um, I, I can't overstate that. And I, to some extent, it's not helpful to, to understate it. It is really critical because public awareness cr produces a public demand and a call for accountability on the state. And Kenyans on Twitter is in itself one of the, has been one of the really powerful drivers for accountability over this COVID period. Um, we can't understand the, um, uh, the imp the speed at which uh, police officers were um, prosecuted um, and administratively moved aside in the case of the Kanjokoma brothers um, during COVID without um, you know without understanding the power of co of um, of Twitter and also social media in terms of making that happen. Um, and there are other examples. I think you know each of the ones that we've talked about. But let, let me turn to other other things that are as critical. You know, public interest litigation has been really important. Um, typically, police brutality cases take um, four to five years for the cycle of um, evidence gathering, investigations, prosecution, um, uh, court hearings to to conviction uh, or uh, non non conviction. 
um, to take place, four to five years. Now imagine the impact on families of victims. Um, so in many ways, I, I mean, I was horrified to see this. And uh, in, in an article I wrote um, recently where I reflected on the, that it took one year for Derek Chauvin um, to be convicted in the case of George Floyd. We have cases like the one you've mentioned, Yasin Moyo or Carlton Minor of Kibera or Evans Joroge of uh, Meru. Um, it, it is now into our third, fourth year in the case of uh, Evans Joroge. And I've said that one of my, um, you know, one of my legacies um, as the Amnesty International Director is to leave the organization with a conviction for Evans Joroge, the student leader. Um, but it is now four years into that um, since he was killed. In fact, uh, this month, huh? um, almost this month. So I think, um, you know, accompanying the criminal justice system to make sure that um, families have lawyers, that they, um, that public attention continues to be raised um, around the court cases is what leads to speedy trials and um, successful convictions. I think the second thing that's really critical is organizational development among communities. And I, I talked about the social justice centers. There, there are essentially legal aid centers rooted in communities um, that are essentially doing legal aid awareness. They are also doing representation work. Uh, they gather evidence. Um, and um, if, if I can just take a minute just to talk a little bit about, you know, what's really uh, caught our attention over the last week or so. Um, in the last week or so, 30 bodies, uh, now 35 bodies, have been recovered from River Yala in Siaya County in the western part of the country. And as I traveled to um, the area to essentially uh, understand what is it that has produced these unidentified bodies, and is it possible that the police agencies have been involved in executing um, suspects of serious crimes or terrorism, um, and that these are essentially extrajudicial killings. Um, what I discovered was that there is a, a, a community muscle that, that is always, that always rises to try and sort out an injustice, and that in many cases they need support. Um, and really over the last week or so, our role has been essentially to make sure that every one of those 35 bodies go through pathology, you know, autopsies to determine the cause of death, but that their DNA and biological evidence is preserved so that one day when there is a criminal case, we have the evidence to be able to link um, uh, murderers to those uh, bodies that showed up in the forest, in the, um, in the river. So I think there are, there are a range of strategies that have uh, been very useful um, in terms of enjoying this. And I think the courts is one arena that any human rights organization in the case of Kenya, uh, and I presume across Africa, have to perfect in terms of uh, doing this work. But I also, you know, I think dialogue um, and uh, outreach to, um, you know, decent and professional um, state officers is the other one, and making sure that they know that we are watching and that we are willing to support them as they boldly go up against powerful interests that have led to the, the kind of evil that we have seen um, uh, in Yala recently, but also in, in other parts of the country. Let me turn to Francesca's point. Um, so let me, let me just start by saying, please do not take anything I've said this evening as a discouragement for you to, um, to elect to join a non-governmental organization, whether it's international or locally focused. Um, I am a complete ad advocate for civic organizations and civic organizing. And I wouldn't have been, you know, I wouldn't be this if, you know, uh, if, if I was not this, I would have moved from this sector and not been here for the last 30 years. I, I still get a lot of energy. I get a lot of uh, satisfaction from the work that I do. But I think there are a number of things that um, the next generation of leadership and this current generation have to bring to the international and the national NGO space. And I, I'll go through them very quickly. The first is that we have to recognize that however, you know, however generous the international finance uh, development uh, industry was, you know, large sums, large percentages of the funding that was destined for places like Africa never reached Africa. It got spent in tide aid programs, in, in resources that um, essentially ensured that international organizations accumulated and spent in headquarters in their headquarters rather than in, in the fields of where they were supposed to have the development impact. So I think resource concentration 
um, in the global north is something we have to challenge. We have to challenge also the disinterest of a number of international NGOs and national organizations with social movements. Because I think the, the danger there is that we do not allow, uh, we do not enable, we do not step aside and enable the social agency to come from within and allow people to take control of their realities and their destinies, which essentially um, that development was arrested way back in the imperialist um, age of colonialism. And to some extent, um, NGOs who take over the agency of others have continued that tradition. So that's the second area. The third one is we must become much more politically um, you know, bold and audacious. Um, the, the national elites across Africa are muscular. They do not listen to um, you know, uh, you know, state officers or presidents um, in the global north as much as they used to. In fact, in some ways, they are contemptuous of them because they have no democratic credentials to offer uh, in practice um, that could create the advisory um, capacity that perhaps they would like to bring to African governments. And therefore, I think we have to be much more bold and politically engaged uh, as non-governmental organizations. The fourth one relates to the, our, the way that we organized. Too many of our organizations are preoccupied with brands. We essentially surround ourselves with very closed bureaucracies. Many of our leaders cannot speak local languages. They cannot step out of their, um, uh, their comfort greeny suburbs. Um, or their green suburbs to be able to go into the informal settlements. And, I, I, and I've tried to keep a muscle internally as I, as I have these positions of power and influence that say that within, you know, every month, let me be found in a community that is bereft of the kind of things that we advocate about. Let me listen to them talk about their realities. And in doing that, I am much more effective, much more aggressive and assertive in the policy roundtables where decisions are made that make a difference to their lives. Um, and, and lastly, I think just coming to the point that's been raised by um, um, Wajira, I think um, I wouldn't worry so much about the overload of issues. I think, you know, wherever human rights violations occur, there has to be uh, a response. And we learned this, you know, so much, so powerfully from the life and legacy of the late Desmond Tutu. You know, Desmond was, was you know, Archbishop Desmond was, was, a, was a wonderful human being. And the thing, I was struck by two or three things, and I wrote about this, uh, I did a, a small obituary for the Kenyan newspapers uh, recently. Um, and the, what I was struck by was that, you know, Desmond Tutu in the 1980s was one of the most hated South Africans um, in South Africa. Um, he was essentially vilified. Um, he was dragged, uh, you know, through the the muck of the of the press. But in twenty or thirty years, maybe forty years, he left this earth essentially as a paragon of moral virtue and a consistent campaigner that not only was involved in racial apartheid issues, but he probably touched on every single. Um, global justice issues that you can think about, right? You can, if you think about climate injustice, if you think about the Palestinian, um, you know, uh, the, the injustices against the Palestinians in Israel and, 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 and Gaza and West Bank, if you think about um, the, um, uh, the injustices against LGBTIQ communities, you know, the voice of the Archbishop um, of Cape Town is as, as, as vibrant as it was you know, back in the 1980s, as it was in the 1920s. And I will leave you with perhaps just two thoughts. One is that all the struggles, I think, as Chaloka has talked about, all these social justice issues can boil down, boil down actually to just four issues. A demand for freedom from fear, freedom from discrimination, freedom from violence, and a demand that everybody has an equal opportunity to, the, to, to, to life by virtue of the fact that they're a human being and that there is no other reason for that. And I think the last thing is, uh, uh, let, me, let me end with a, a, a paraphrasing a quote from Desmond Tutu. And he said something like this. He says, the moral universe um, is very much built on the Martin Luther King uh, quote, uh, but he said, the moral universe is always with us. It may take years, it may take centuries, but at some point, the moral universe will find its way to rectifying an injustice. And in many ways, his life was an example of that.
Fantastic. That's what we need to hear. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chaloka, for really uh, good insights and comments. Thank you, Irungu. I just want to say, you know, the, 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 the research on people like you, Irungu, <laughs> talks about um, people who can bridge between local communities and sort of the, the, the corridors of power at a global level. You are definitely one of those bridging individuals equally at home in the, in the playground, literally, uh, or, or, or at the World Bank or wherever, it, or WTO, wherever it is. And it's fascinating to watch how you've moved between them. Fantastic insider insights. I hope the students on the call appreciated what an insider and honest reflection this was. This is a genuine cutting edge issue lecture, and that's what we like. And also just a sight of the kind of leadership, speaking from an Oxfam point of view, the kind of leadership we need now um, going, on, going forward. Um, so I think we've, it's been a real privilege to have both of you on the call. Thank you so much. And just to say, we've got coming up in the next uh, three weeks, um, three very powerful and impressive women. Lise, Lise Grande, talking as a UN veteran, talking about peace building. Isabella Weber, a brilliant economist talking about China. And Rafif Ziada, fantastic scholar and poet, talking about deindustrialization in Pakistan. I'm sorry, in Palestine. It's been a long day. Beg your pardon. Um, so do come back next week and the weeks after, but we've had a really good evening. Please go out and get people listening to the podcast and the YouTube video, because I think this has been a really excellent session. Thanks, everyone. See you next week. Thanks, Doug. Thank you, Ruby. Sorry. <laughs> Please buy the book. <laughs> All the best, everybody. Okay. You guys stay on.